The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, mid-year market and economic update. My name is Brian Beatty. I'm one of the partners here, and I want to introduce to you uh, this topic for our webinar today. We have asked one of our third-party portfolio managers for some of our clients to speak to you today uh, and give an update on mid-year market and economics, and that company is City National Rockdale. And our speaker today is Tom Galvin. He's the managing director and senior portfolio manager. Mr. Gavin joined the former Rockdale Investment Management Team, predecessor to City National Rockdale, in 2012. He works directly with the CIO to guide the firm's equity research functions, and he's a member of the Asset Allocation Committee. Uh, he's also leading the Core Equity Research Team and co-manages the U.S. Core Equity Strategy for Rockdale. Galvin, uh, Mr. Galvin has over 30 years of equity investment experience from financial services organizations such as Lehman Brothers, Smith Barney, Horseman Left and UBS. Uh, formerly, he was managing partner of Galvin Asset Management, managing net, high net worth in individuals' assets. And at UBS, he was a senior portfolio manager, director of research, where he managed over $8 billion of large cap core institutional and mutual fund portfolios. So uh, I just want to let you know that at the end of the presentation, we will be doing Q&As. So what we ask you to do is during any time during the presentation, just email any questions that you have to cmwu at ebwllc.com. That should be on your screen right now. <clears throat> just email your questions, and we will, at the end, ask the questions uh, that we receive uh, from these emails directly to Mr. Galvin. And without further ado, I want to welcome Mr. Tom Galvin. We're going to give him control of the screen now. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone, and hopefully, Brian, everyone can see my screen now. I'll take that as a yes, and we'll begin. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. What I'm going to review for you today is our 2015 mid-year market and economic update and why we believe there are good reasons to remain optimistic about the U.S. economy and financial assets in the general. Key takeaway, lower for longer, meaning lower GDP growth, lower inflation, lower interest rates. They're good for stocks and good for an extended economic cycle. So we have uh, today a good presentation for you. I'm uh, going to start out with a, a brief summary. Then we'll uh, go to the economic outlook that, that we have. And we'll uh, conclude with uh, portfolio uh, strategy and positioning and then take, take your questions at the end. So the U.S. appears to be exiting from its first quarter slumber, as we like to say, uh, and uh, looks like we're showing signs of picking up ground. Uh, the uh, GDP report for the second quarter was released this morning. It came in around 2.3 percent, a little bit below where economists were at, but showed a nice uh, uptick from the first quarter level that was revised upward uh, from minus 0.3 to positive 0.3. Beneath the surface, consumption uh, of uh, goods and services by consumers stayed uh, robust at around 2.9%. So we uh, do see optimism from the economic reports showing the uh, pickup. And uh, this is uh, very, very uh, encouraging to us because global growth does remain constrained by high debt levels around the world. We have and continue to remain positive on the U.S. equity outlook. We do think this is a year uh, that we'll see higher volatility. We've uh, kind of categorized it as a year where we'll, we'll be sailing through choppy seas, and uh, but nevertheless think we're going to come out fine through this uh, choppy uh, sea um, segment with the bull market fully intact. We see only modest increases uh, in U.S. Um, interest rates. We think the Fed will pursue a slow and gradual recovery uh, as the uh, path to normalization on, on, on unwinds, and we'll see rates go up at a, at a very slow and gradual pace. Um, the divergence that's going on in terms of central bank policies is likely to heighten the attractiveness of uh, U.S. assets compared to uh, 
other places in the world because a strong dollar historically has been nicely correlated with the stronger GDP growth and stronger financial asset returns. Greece uh, con continues to fade, I believe, from the uh, scene in terms of a, a risk factor. Uh, while those in Greece are going to be suffering um, austerity for a few years, it's, we are not worried about it uh, turning into a more global financial crisis. On to the economy. We uh, see a, uh, we're going to present to you some uh, slides showing that the fundamentals are getting stronger, driven by labor improving, inflation staying low, spending by consumers showing, you know, health. The U.S. continuing to separate itself out from the rest of the world in terms of a number of different economic uh, measures, and all of that will um, add up to the Fed, as I said, pursuing a slow but gradual rate in increase going forward. Hopefully, you've seen our, our speedometers before. Uh, it's a nice graphical way to represent how we view uh, the risks in uh, the economy and how it relates to the financial uh, markets. Uh, green is good, red is bad uh, on this uh, uh, chart. You can see there's a lot of green and not, not a lot of red uh, currently. Uh, starting up at the uh, top left there, you can see that uh, a lot of the monetary U.S. economic yield curve indicators are all nicely green, and that's a very positive sign uh, for the economic outlook. Uh, second uh, row on the left there, you can see a number of the consumer-related ones where housing and uh, mortgage availability, an improving labor market, uh, consumer spending, all heading in the right direction. And that's good because the consumer represents roughly two-thirds of economic activity here in uh, the U.S. The only place where we see red is in the geopolitical uh, uh, slide there. Um, things seem to be improving some somewhat, but we're still on high alert to make sure that there's no exogenous uh, shocks that, that could derail the uh, positive outlook that, that we see. For, for those who like a more quantitative assessment, we have our economic monitor, uh, uh, which is a proprietary view that, that we have, where we look at a lot of important uh, indicators of the U.S. economic uh, health, forward-looking indicators, such as the leading indicator series, uh, a lot of monetary, fiscal, uh, real-world GDP investment type of um, areas to come up with our assessment <clears throat> to, to see where economic activity is and what the relative strength is. And as you can see down at the, the bottom right, our total score is around 7.1. That puts us at the low end of the uh, positive scale, but still in the uh, positive uh, range. So that, that, that points to an improving outlook. Uh, there's a lot of uh, positive indicators, and, and the risk for a recession is quite low in our uh, view. So uh, GDP is picking back up. Um, this chart shows the drawdown that we saw in the early part of 2015, that little dip down in the dark blue bar that you can see there. Uh, this chart does not reflect what was reported this morning, but it, it, it does show, I think the most important thing is here, that with that Q1 abnormality behind us, we're on track to, you know, re rebound for economic growth going into next year in the kind of two to two and a half uh, percent uh, range. We uh, do have confidence in this range because of the labor market continues to show steady improvement. Uh, 200,000 jobs being added every every month is a good thing. We're up to uh, a six-month trailing average of 226. And it, it may bounce around from month to month, some months being above, some, some months being below. But the net net of it all is a, a good job picture for uh, consumers. This chart perhaps shows it best. From the depths of the recession, uh, there have been about 12 million jobs added in the last five years. Uh, so the uh, pace of the job gains is nice and consistent. More people are getting back to work. But perhaps most importantly, there are about 5 million job openings out there in the economy. So as businesses continue to gain confidence, they're looking to hire. The more you hire, the virtuous cycle of consumer spending helping to uh, produce good economic activity is uh, key. Having a job is very important, and so there's been a lot of jobs created and still five, five million or so yet, yet to be filled. Now, with that increase in the number of jobs, what we've seen is a decline in the overall unemployment rate. 
So this uh, shows the uh, traditional measure that the uh, Fed looks at and how the unemployment rate has declined uh, from the 10% area down to this uh, mid to low fives uh, uh, currently. So with the uh, pace of job creation that, that we're seeing and the number of job openings that exist out there, we, we think it's quite likely in the not too distant future by this measure of employment, the Fed will be down in that 5% area and helping to uh, fulfill its first uh, uh, mandate, and that is having full employment. The, the other part of its uh, mandate here on this slide is to maintain the stable inflation uh, environment and keep prices and the increase in prices on, under control. So their, their target uh, is to have inflation core PCE running at around a 2% level. The last few years it's been below that, kind of moved up but once and you know touched it on the core CPI, but it's been below um, for you know quite some time. We we don't think that there's um, any more downward pressure on the inflation level because jobs are being created, wages are picking back up, but uh, we also don't think there is much risk that we're going to start running through and above the 2% two, two uh, level. It's just not the type of an economy that's going to create a lot of upward pressure on inflation. So the Fed, the good news here is that it gives the Fed a lot of runway in terms of its interest rate uh, policy. We'll uh, touch on that in a, a few minutes, but it's, it's a positive backdrop, and so the uh, Fed is likely to raise rates, but not under a lot of pressure to do so. Um, spending drives our economy. Uh, consumer spending is about two, two, two thirds of it, and this uh, chart shows the recession period since the 1970, how spending levels have you know, have uh, progressed during this time frame. On average, they're roughly around 3% 3, 3 or so um, during this time frame. This recovery has been so far a subpar level in terms of spending compared to the historic trends, but we're up to this 3% level, it was 2.9 uh, in the Q2 GDP report, as I mentioned earlier, and things are looking like we could, you know, tick somewhat above the average uh, level. So. Spending is good for the economy, spending is good, and it's likely to continue to stay relatively healthy because of the labor uh, market uh, environment that uh, we talked about. So where are people spending? Well, autos have experienced a really nice rebound. Uh, this, this chart shows the history of auto sales since the 2000 time frame. Uh, in general economic cycles, you see the, um, the seasonally adjusted annual rate in the kind of 15 to 17 million uh, range, um, and uh, and so that's generally where uh, auto sales uh, occur during a normal economic uh, time frame. Uh, from the uh, rebound in the recession, we had that big surge up the, in the cash for clunkers program as the government was trying to kickstart uh, spending. Uh, set since then. It's been on a nice upward trajectory, and as you can see, we've kind of achieved the average level that uh, historically is where auto sales in a normal like an, an environment are. But we we, we think uh, auto sales are likely to stay higher for longer because of uh, several factors. One, interest rates are likely to stay low, so the zero percent down low financing rate type of offers are likely to continue to be offered. Secondly, there is a relatively robust securitization market for auto uh, loans, and that's likely to continue because it's one of the few places where there's not a lot of regulatory constraint in place. And then lastly, the average age of an automobile on the road in America today is roughly 10 and a half to 11 years. So uh, people, people want to trade in their uh, cars. There's a lot of new exciting technology in uh, vehicles these days. Safety's improved. Um, and it's it's a good environment for, for auto spending. So that's that's one of the areas that's doing well. Um, the uh, overall retail sales environment, um, as I said earlier, was about two two point nine percent on a consumption uh, measured basis. When retail sales are strong, that tends to create uh, more economic activity, which in turn increases the capacity utilization rate. That as that utilization rate uh, continues to move higher, 
it does encourage uh, companies to invest more in their facilities to meet the increasing demand uh, that they see coming. So industrial production, which has been kind of soft uh, in the first part of this year, uh, as the economy has pulled back, there's been some you know caution out there. Businesses are wanting to make sure that you know things are on track in the domestic environment. There's been some macro uncertainties out there. So it's likely with the uh, job labor, wage gains that we've seen, the retail sales number going into the second half of the year is likely to be uh, pretty good, and industrial production is likely to follow behind it. The uh, one place that has been a laggard is the housing market. So this, this slide shows residential investment over the uh, past uh, four economic cycles, including this one, and the uh, line showed the pace of the recovery in the housing markets, and generally, in the past, you look at the, the gray line in 1974, the lighter blue line for the 1981 cycle, and the darker blue line in 1991, they, they, they had some pretty good recoveries where they got back to the levels that they were at prior to those recessions, in less than a 20-month time period. This time, it's been a lot slower, um, and we're way far behind where the prior peak was. Now, why is that the case? Well, banks, um, be because of the financial crisis, one of the you know key fault lines in that crisis was the uh, aggressive lending. So um, regulators have been um, calling for higher capital requirements on home mortgages being made. Uh, that's resulted in banks having higher FICO scores as, as uh, consumers uh, come in to apply for uh, loans. I don't know if, if you or any of your family members out there have encouraged it, but it's uh, and and encountered it. But it's it's a much slower approval process. A lot more forms to be filled out, uh, checks to be signed within the bank before a uh, mortgage loan is made. So the regulatory constraints have been uh, very real. Secondly, jobs have been rebounding, but you know, at a slower pace, and the types of jobs that have been created aren't the higher income level jobs. And then thirdly, you have had um, the shift to the millenniums, where instead of um, seeking out uh, housing, many of them are preferring to stay in urban areas or stay at home with uh, mom and dad, so the first-time buyer coming into the market has been somewhat uh, absent. So this slow rebound uh, is likely to gradually move move up and should eventually catch up to its uh, uh, prior peak. So we're uh, optimistic on the rebound. Don't see a hockey stick coming, but we do think it's likely to continue to move higher. Now, why is that? Uh, well, if you look at this uh, chart, you can see several several measures of, of the housing market beyond just sales. So upper left there, you can see home builders confidence is up. Uh, that's up. Why is that? Well, it, it's due to a lot of factors. Uh, going down to the bottom left, you can see that housing affordability is quite 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 good. Um, it's as a percentage of um, income, housing prices are much more affordable these days than they were in the 80s and the uh, 90s and early 2000s. To the bottom right, you can see mortgage rates trending lower since the early 2000s, low by historic uh, fashions, and uh, they're um, likely to move somewhat higher when the Fed raises its rates, but they're still quite uh, attractive. And lastly, up at the top right, you can see home ownership levels have returned to levels in, in, in the past that would suggest that the demand is likely to pick up. So housing, one of the last um, areas of the economy to get back on track to where it was prior to the uh, recession, looks like it's uh, going to continue to climb up higher at a uh, slower pace. Um, housing prices have been up 4, 5, 6% or so. I think that's a good thing. It's, it's reflecting a tighter supply of available homes uh, on an existing home basis as well as on a new home being built basis. And uh, with increasing confidence by consumers going forward, the housing market looks like it should do uh, better going forward. So with that, the U.S. Uh, is likely to continue to decouple 
from the overall um, global economic um, area. So on the top left there, you see the trade weighted dollar, and you can see how it's moved up nicely from the low in 2011. And we think a stronger dollar is likely to continue. Uh, why is that? Well, top, top right, you, you can see how strong the U.S. GDP has been coming out of this recession, especially compared to Europe. It's just been a nice move up higher. Europe has a lot of structural headwinds, demographic trends, productivity trends, austerity seems to be the uh, policy choice of the uh, day over in uh, Europe. So Europe's been struggling. Japan's doing a little bit better. China's slowing down, but so the U.S. has really been standing out. Bottom right, you see inflation quite quite contained in the U.S., but a stable inflationary environment as opposed to Europe, where they're struggling against the headwinds of deflation. You know, most recent reading 0.88 percent. They've got down close to 0.5 percent, and whereas the U.S. better overall environment, respectable inflation rate. Last slide, bottom left there, you can see the Global Purchasing Managers Index from the U.S., Japan, Europe, and, and China. Uh, they're all currently in the growing uh, category. Um, there's been some slowdown in some of the regions in the U.S. has ticked down, but we're still growing at a faster pace than these other regions of the world. So as a result, the U.S. continues to, to look look good. Uh, the economic backdrop's very, very nice, and a stronger dollar is likely to uh, continue to be the case going forward. So what does this all mean for interest rates? Well, the Fed has been signaling every time uh, Janet Yellen gets up to uh, present to Congress uh, and, and others on the Federal Reserve Board, uh, indicating that they're poised to raise rates this year. Um, our view is that they will start in, in September, but it's going to be a slow and gradual buildup. Uh, the chart at the top uh, shows the uh, in the blue bar the range of uh, forecasts uh, of the FOMC back in June the 17th, and the red bar that cuts across it is kind of the median uh, forecast of uh, those uh, people on the Fed. So you can see those blue bars indicate there's quite a wide divergence within the Fed in terms of where the Fed funds rate should be. And uh, so a, 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 a lot of uh, internal discussion. So you can see why the uh, markets are having a little trouble coming up with a um, you know solidly confident view in terms of where the Fed funds rate is because the people inside the, the Fed have such a wide range. So um, the uh, red line is kind of where we we see the Fed funds rates uh, um, um, going uh, up in the uh, short term this uh, year. We do see it, it uh, going higher with the first hike in the September uh, time frame. We, we also throw the um, chart in at the bottom, which shows that the Fed's uh, uh, forecasts have been somewhat on the overall optim overly optimistic side. Um, the range of those blue bars has, has come down. The level of the red bars has come down. So um, they've, they've been a, a bit optimistic. And uh, so we think a slow and gradual uh, ascent in terms of the economic environment is the, the, the likely outcome here going forward. So to wrap up the economic outlook section, uh, we do believe the U.S. economy is on stable ground should continue to, to grow and expand at a modest pace, two to two and a half percent, you know, probably the you know, right the, uh, number to think about. Growth in the labor markets over the last few years uh, has been solid. Confidence is up, incomes are up, therefore people have more money to spend and God bless Americans, give them a dollar and they're more, more likely to spend them these days. Uh, inflationary pressures are moving up some, but they're gonna be nicely contained. Uh, as they move up towards the Fed uh, level. Uh, the housing market seems to have started uh, to, it's continued to move up higher. You add up all, all these factors and the U.S. economy is likely to be stronger than other places in, in the world and we do see the Fed raising rates. Portfolio strategy. So how does one position oneself uh, for this uh, environment? So just a, a quick look, uh, year-to-date returns, you can see the uh, blue, blue bars uh, 
on a year of date and, and a one year trailing basis. We we kind of came into this year thinking it was going to be kind of a choppy seas environment and um, for uh, the stock market. So through uh, June, uh, we're up a, a modest 1.2 percent, but on a, a trailing 12 month basis, up uh, very nicely, up uh, 7.4 percent. Uh, Europe's been a bit stronger uh, year to date, but uh, lagging quite a bit on a trailing uh, uh, basis. Uh, fi fixed incomes quite uh, quite uh, benign uh, levels of return year to date and, and on a trailing basis as well. And the commodities have been hurt quite a bit from some of the slowness that we've seen globally, uh, particularly uh, recently with the concerns uh, coming out of China and the pace of their economic activity. And so we've been kind of staying away from uh, commodities and and uh, so, but that's the uh, snapshot uh, at the uh, end of June. Uh, as it relates to equities, everyone's favorite asset class to uh, talk about, uh, we have had and continue to have an optimistic view towards equities, that, that lower for longer, lower economic growth, lower inflation, lower interest rates is a good backdrop for uh, stocks. Uh, this uh, equity market scorecard, one of our proprietary measures that we use here at City National Rockdale, uh, shows uh, the Asset Allocation Committee's collective wisdom on a numeric basis in terms of how we see things, such as the economic outlook, corporate profitability, monetary conditions, valuation of the uh, markets, and uh, the overall technical indicators um, out there. And we also keep our eye on uh, financial risk from a, a systemic basis. So like our speedometers, green is good. So we have more green here. We don't have any reds. Valuations at the upper end, so that's kind of a, a neutral yellowish color there. But you add them all up, and we have a total score in terms of where um, the uh, um, outlook for stocks is at a solid 6.6%. Over the last three years, we've kind of been in this mid-sixes to low sevens range. It hasn't really changed all that much. But right now, we're at a, a, a very solid 6.6%. Uh, it does point to a uh, overweight towards stocks, a modest overweight. Um, and uh, underpinning this favorable outlook for stocks that, that, that we've had for some time now and continue to have, because we do think we're in a secular bull market, is this view that the economy is good. So. Uh, if, if you look at this slide, it, it, it's a building block slide where we take things like our expectations for real U.S. GDP, about 2.5% or so, where we think inflation is going to end up, about 1.5%. International GDP growth should be somewhat higher than the U.S., so we add a 0.5%. Corporations flush with cash, strong um, uh, profitability. They've been using that to buy back stocks, and that's adding about 2% uh, to earnings growth rates. And then margins are quite healthy. There's a cost-conscious mentality out there, corporate CEOs trying to hold on to their uh, uh, market share but still controlling those costs, and there's good incremental margins um, out there. So you add all that up, and it, it, it points to an earnings forecast of roughly 8% 8, 8 or so for the 12 months looking forward. Uh, now, there, there are some big headwinds. Um, the dollar is a headwind. Lower energy prices are a, a, a headwind. So we, we add them all up, and we, we, we see roughly 3% um, headwinds over the next 12 months or, or so. And bottom line is we, we see about 5.8% earnings growth. Um, now, that 5% 0.8% earnings growth is basically in line with the long-term 100-some-odd-year historic record where there's about 6% average earnings growth for the S&P. So we, we think we're, you know, the, the days of big margin expansion, big earnings growth are behind us, but we're kind of settling into a, you know, around a 6% earnings growth rate uh, going forward. Now, th there are some things that can influence that uh, forecast. And there's multitude of forces out there that could inf influence positively and negatively, not only on the earnings, but on the PE when it comes to stocks. So we, we, we have them listed here for you. Uh, you. You can see on the upper left, positives for the S&P 500. 
include a lower price of oil and other commodities. We've seen oil get hit last year in the, in the uh, fourth quarter, continuing to be under pressure this year. It's bad for the energy companies, but ultimately it's good for corporate profitability. It's good for consumers, although consumers so far haven't uh, chosen to spend the incremental savings that they're getting uh, from energy prices being lower. It looks like they're preferring to save some more, pay down a little debt, maybe spend a little bit, but not spend the entire amount that they're uh, receiving in terms of those uh, benefits. But lower oil and commodities outside of the oil patch being hurt and hurting companies that sell into the oil patch, it's a net positive for um, the consumer and for um, overall profitability. A stronger domestic economy clearly is a good thing for uh, profits. The, the faster an economy grows, the more the revenues are out there for uh, companies to sell, the better the sales are, the you know better the uh, growth opportunities are. You combine that with a, a continued cost control mentality, uh, it, it all adds up to you know, positive things for earnings. Now that cost control men mentality is very important. Uh, if we had a chart that showed you the cycles of profit margins uh, over many, many years, it ebbs and flows, it gets as low as six, it gets as high as you know about the 11% or so area on the net margin. And we've been at that level for some time now. Our view has been that it would stay at that level and hold there for a while because the cost control mentality of corporations is such that they're not going to hire aggressively. They still see macro issues. They still still see concerns. So they're not hiring aggressively. They're not investing in their plant and equipment aggressively. But they still have a lot of good cash ca cash flow coming in because the top line is growing. They've got good margins. So what are they doing with their cash flow? They're buying back stock and paying out more dividends. And so this this cost control mentality produces a positive impact on on S&P earnings. On the negative side for the earnings outlook is a stronger U.S. dollar does create a headwind for U.S. companies that have uh, businesses overseas. It's roughly a third or so of the S&P 500. Uh, earnings come from overseas markets, so it makes it more challenging for those companies who have a global presence to make their earnings uh, forecast work. Uh, China GDP slowing does create uh, some uncertainties, particularly in the emerging markets area that uh, benefit from uh, China's growth and those that are selling into China. So we're keeping our eye on uh, that one. And also, as I pointed out, profit margins are near the peak, but we I think we're you know, going uh, longer there. On the multiple side, this is the psychology side of the uh, market. Low inflation is good. The lower inflation levels are, the more the visibility for earnings is and the higher PE, you would be willing to pay for those earnings. Um, the uh, oil drop price historically has been a good thing for, for, for PE multiples. Although it may not be playing out this year, historically U.S. election cycles uh, should, should point to a good, good year for uh, stocks. And improving confidence in an economic growth does help uh, multiples because people are then willing to discount more and more earnings into the uh, future. On the negative front, a higher Fed funds rate uh, historically has had a negative impact on PEs. So historically for every 100 basis point uh, impact or, or every 100 basis point rise in the Fed funds rate, it has a negative impact on the PE of 1x. So if the market is selling at a 17 multiple, 1x of that 17 or 1 divided by 17 is roughly about a 6-7% earnings headwind. So that's, that's where the um, uh, uh, negative comes in from a lower multiple from higher uh, uh, Fed funds rate. Also, un uncertainty in the, in, in the world, whether it's China's uncertainty, Greece, the Middle East, you name it, this world is not uh, at a loss for geopolitical risk and, and increased uncertainty does tend to damper PE multiples for uh, stocks as uh, as people aren't willing to look out any further into the uh, future. So where do we get that 5.8% uh, earnings growth rate that we've seen? And here are some of the factors that could shift that. But our base case, as you can see on this chart, is as we look forward, 
12 months into the middle part of June of uh, 2016, we think the S&P earnings at that time frame are going to be about 127 or so. Uh, that gets that's you can see the the 5.8 percent uh, earnings growth is uh, represented there and so okay so where should the stock market sell so right now we believe with where rates are at low low interest rates stocks are attractive because of the all the issues that we talked about on the PE we think the market's likely to stay in this 17 to 17 and a half forward PE for the stock market. And um, you add those numbers up, do the math, it, it kind of points to a range looking forward, four quarters of a fair value or target price, if you will, of 21.59 for the S&P to 22.23. So let's just call it, you know, 2200 in the uh, midpoint and we're, we're, we're looking for a good solid return, about 6.5% price in that range of 5 to 8, 8% or so. Add on a, another percent or two for uh, dividend uh, yield, and it's it's a, a pretty solid outlook for uh, stocks. It's definitely going to beat inflation. It's likely to beat uh, uh, core fixed income um, returns over this time frame, but we will have some enhanced volatility. It's it's kind of normal. So this slide shows a history of volatility in uh, since uh, 1980, as it shows the calendar year returns in blue and the intra-year declines in red. So you can see during some extreme cases, the 87 crash where we, there was an intra-year decline of 30 coming uh, out of the 9-11 attacks down 28 during the financial crisis uh, minus 37, minus 38 percent. There were there's some pretty severe declines that can happen in a month. But 70% of the time the markets are up, and 70% of the time they have returns that are less than 10% to the downside on an entry year basis. That's what the chart at the uh, bottom says. So recently we've been in kind of a subpar year where the recent entry year declines, minus 7, minus 3. Last year in the October kind of time frame, we just about touched that minus 10% level. I think it was 9.9 uh, exact. This year we've had a minus four so, so so far. We think because of all those cross currents that we talked about with the risk to the multiples, risk to the earnings, that this choppy seas environment is, is such that we, we could have another down 10, maybe even a down 15% type of intra-year correction. But that doesn't mean that the bull market is is over. We, we, we think we're in a secular bull market and just keep your seatbelts fastened as we get through these uh, choppy seats. Uh, Europe's a topic of uh, conversation. Uh, we get a lot of questions on uh, Europe. Uh, we have been underweight uh, for quite some time because of all the structural headwinds that Europe faces, demographics, austerity, lack of productivity, you name it. Um, and so the chart at the top shows uh, over the last year the S&P 500 returns of around 9.6 percent is represented by the blue bar. Europe has re rebounded on the backs of quantitative easing, a lower euro, and lower oil prices. So in local terms, the euro stock index is up a little bit more than the S&P 500, but on dollar terms, it's been lagging quite a bit because the dollar's been so strong. Uh, another reason that's been holding us back in terms of our weights to uh, Europe is that the PE multiple uh, if you compare it to the S&P weightings of the multiples, it's really not that uh, attractive. Uh, in some measures, Europe can look cheaper because of the way that index is constructed. It has more financial companies. It has, and, and it, it doesn't have as many healthcare or tech companies. So financials tend to have lower PEs. Healthcare and tech, which are in the U.S., tend to have higher multiples. So the U.S. may look more expensive, but in reality, if you normalize for the, for the sectoral differences in the way the indices are constructed, Europe's really not that uh, attractive on an APE basis. Uh, we, we see some really good increases in, uh, I'm sorry, we see some rate increases uh, coming, um, but we uh, think they will be um, gradual. As you can see on this chart, uh, the dashed yellow line shows where the yield curve was about a year or so ago. 
Uh, and through uh, the end of uh, June, the blue line, we've had a bit of a flattening out of the uh, curve um, as um, rates have moved uh, down. And the consensus view is the red line. Uh, everyone's looking for rates to be moving up as the Fed moves up higher, the economy gets uh, better, and so the yield curve is expected to move up uh, higher in the next year on that uh, red line. The 10 years, the consensus looks like it's going to be around 10% 10, 10 or so. We think that's likely to prove to be a little bit too um, too high based on what, what we're seeing, um, but that's an, an upward sloping uh, curve is a, a positive and higher uh, rates is to be expected, but not to be overly con concerned about either because they're, they're, they're low by historic uh, measures. Uh, we continue to favor uh, high yield uh, both domestically and um, internationally. EM recently there's been some more volatility because of uh, China, but there's still attractive spreads compared to the historic average. Um, in, in the U.S., uh, somewhat uh, less attractive compared to historic averages but still good, healthy returns in the 5% uh, area. And we, we see default rates staying low and in a low interest rate environment, having exposure to opportunistic income in our view is quite uh, a positive. So to uh, wrap it all up, this chart is a graphical representation of our asset allocation positioning. So you look at that black triangle there, we've been uh, modestly overweight um, uh, U.S. equities favoring uh, my uh, product area, U.S. core, uh, kind of in line with mid and small and slightly overweight dividend income as uh, well. Underweight international markets particularly uh, developed, uh, a lot of structural headwinds in many of the developed markets. Uh, emerging markets, we are neutral there, uh, liking the longer term growth potential of those em emerging markets, short term volatility not notwithstanding. We've been underweight core, core fixed income for quite some time, overweight opportunistic, um, as I just touched on, and underweight real assets because we don't see much threat of inflation at this point in time. So with that, why don't we stop, take questions. Uh, Brian, Carmen, I'll turn it back to you guys. Uh, and I believe all the questions are going to flow uh, through uh, Brian. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, terrific presentation, Tom. If, would you mind going back one screen for just a moment? I want to make a quick comment, then I want to open the floor for questions again. The asset allocation positioning, this is a perspective of one of the portfolio teams that we take research from. Um, this is their consensus based on their own internal uh, polling or readings. It may, be this, it may be similar in some regards to the weightings that we have in our model portfolios. It really depends upon which client. And if you have any questions about your particular holdings or questions about asset allocation in relationship to their positioning, please make sure you reach out and speak to your advisor. I have one question to start with, and then I want to remind the uh, participants that if you email cmwu at ebwllc, we can also take your questions as well. We've got about 10 minutes for Q&A at most. First question I have is, you'll notice the rotation between growth and value in 2015, Tom. Uh, you guys are expecting rising dividends, yet in 2015, value, which is where you find dividend payers, has underperformed growth. Can you address that a little bit? Uh, yes. Um, so we um, have um, a view that growth uh, stocks as a style um, in the U.S. equity markets this year is a good place to be in the core equity strategy. We have tilted um, our um, holdings in the core equities to the growth style. Uh, we've had an overweight there. If you look at our bar metrics and, and other metrics, we had an overweight for growth. And part of the reason why we've done so well within core this year has been that tilt towards growth, uh, good good quality companies with nice visible earnings growth um, just have preferred that that's been a good area. Value has lagged because value is generally um, driven by how financials do and how energy stocks do. Uh, the financials are being held back because the interest rate environment, uh, they need higher rates, a wider curve. Uh, so their net interest margins, which are 
that they've been stable recently, but very low by historic uh, fashions, um, they need to move up, and so they they need the Fed policy to get going to to take rates up uh, higher. In terms of dividend growers in our high dividend income uh, strategy, we do emphasize those companies that not only have good earnings, uh, good 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 dividend yields, but have a strong underlying ability to grow those dividends at a, a rate that's keeping up, if not higher, than the average increase that we've seen in a lot of dividend growth this year to about 10 percent. Okay, thank you. Um, reminder that you can email in your questions at cmwu, cmwu at ebwllc.com. Uh, one more question uh, coming from our team here, Tom, is with the the drop in energy prices, that's a negative for earnings on the S&P 500. But at the same time, it's a positive for economic activity, and there's a lag between economic activity and earnings. Can you give some in, um, sort of a, a expectation as to how this positive economic trend, which is negative for earnings, will turn into being a positive earnings trend down the road? Yeah, no, um, excellent point, Brian. So uh, on, on the first part, the, uh, the headwinds, from energy on reported earnings, they are real. Um, just give you a, a, for instance, in the first quarter of 2015, uh, final reported per share earnings for the S&P 500 were 1%. If you took energy out, earnings growth would have been 8%. So it's a big headline, or you know, um, if you think of earnings like headline earnings growth of 1%, everyone's getting worried about that. You take like X energy, kind of like your core earnings growth, if you will, it's 8%. That's, you know, pretty good. So it's it's a dampening on the headline, good underlying. And as you pointed out, Brian, it does benefit the economy in a lag basis. And what that lag is, 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 is hard to gauge. Like historically, you know, six to nine months or so, all those savings tend to flow back into the economy, as but so far it's been a little slower. I think uh, consumers have been somewhat uh, more cautious in terms of their spending overall. Um, they are spending, but they're not accelerating their spending. Uh, they have been deleveraging over the last couple of years, and so I think some of the savings that they have gotten from the lower energy prices, both you know, oil going into the house or uh, gasoline going into their cars. Uh, for, for, for every dollar, it, it seems like they are maybe spending a quarter of that dollar, but saving and spending down debt, the uh, balance of it. So uh, both Visa and MasterCard, uh, companies that, that we own, and I, I listened to their conference calls, have been surprised. Um, at that slow pace of the consumer uh, spending. So I, I think it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing here because corporations are also benefiting from lower energy prices. Anybody who has oil, natural gas, is input prices that go into their final product, they're seeing margin uh, benefits from it. But until they start to see, like the consumer start to spend a little bit more, I think they're going to be holding back. So. What that lag effect is this time isn't quite clear. It, it, it may be at the longer end of the kind of normal six to nine months, but at some point it should start to be a positive contributor, all things being equal, on any other confidence uh, items. You know, if there's an exogenous shock or something else like that, you know, all else being equal, they should start to spend, and, and it could be building up to a really nice finish to the year. Now, if we get through the summer and you know, no more crises, China settles down, back to school, spending by consumers, something to keep your eyes on because there's a high correlation with spending in, into the Christmas uh, season. If that starts falling into place, that lag effect in industrial production from that one chart I referred to, companies may start spending again and that's, that's, that's when we could start to um, see a bit of an uptick uh, coming in. Okay, this next question comes from our attendees. The um, current 30-year fixed rate on a mortgage is in the mid, lower to mid uh, four-point percentage range. What's your outlook for, say, the next one to two years on movements in the 30-year fixed mortgage market? 
Well, we don't we don't forecast the mor the mortgage market per se. Um, we just focus on the uh, treasuries. Uh, we, we think that the upper end of the um, 10 year through the remaining part of this year is probably two and a half percent, low end maybe towards two. Um, and as we roll into next year, it'll it'll move somewhat higher. So kind of take that range up somewhat. We haven't put out the official number yet, but our thinking is that it will be up somewhat, but below that 3% level for the uh, 10, 10 year. In, in terms of the spread uh, on you know mortgages versus treasuries, uh, I don't think it should deviate all that much because uh, because of the regulatory um, um, handcuffs. Well. The, constraints that the uh, banks are under right now. I don't think they're going to start lending uh, aggressively. So on, while while the demand should materialize, put, putting a little bit of an upward pressure on rates, it, it shouldn't like significantly change the spread, I would think, between mortgages and the 10-year. Uh, ten, ten okay. Thank you. Um, one additional question uh, coming from our team here. Uh, you've got marked in your positive uh, or your, your um, potential uh, good information economically, the historic U.S. election cycle. But I wanted to ask a slightly, a little bit of a twist on that question. Given the heavy regulatory environment, which has really dampened growth, if you, uh, if you could address what happens if we get a more pro-business outcome from the 2016 election, um, what would that do potentially to goose the growth rate if the elections lined up to be a more pro-business environment? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I think probably the single most important issue kind of facing our nation at this point in time. Uh, first, before I answer, let me give you an uh, analogy. So the way I've seen these last couple of years is if, if you kind of picture you're driving a car, right, and monetary policy is, your, is the gas pedal, right? So the gas pedal's been down to the metal through the floor somewhat, right? Fiscal policy, because Washington just kind of can't get along with each other. They're, you know, we're in first gear, if you will, and the regulators have like slammed on the brakes. So what's the outcome? It's kind of below average growth, right? So if we got a shift in the elections to pro business, you know, and whatever that takes, you know, lower tax rates to the top of my list, but any other thing, you know, incentives for hiring, incentives for spending. Whatever it takes, if you get a more pro-business, that could be the um, shift to a higher growth out, outlook. Um, can't anticipate that, but I think a, a pro-business would be just what the doctor ordered. Okay, terrific. Uh, we have two more questions from our attendees, and then I think we'll wind up wrapping it up, and I'll have a final comment. The first question is, someone brought up that you're, you've mentioned a lot of companies have a lot of cash. Uh, and uh, how are they spending it? I think you told us about buybacks, but is there significant rises in capital spending recently? And uh, are companies consistently increasing their de dividend payouts with this cash flow? Yeah, no, great uh, question. Also gets to the whole mindset um, out there. I think it, uh, corporations still cautiously optimistic, right? So revenues are growing, they're chugging along, they're slow, but they're growing. They're keeping their costs under control, so margins are great. They've got a lot of cash flow. Cash flow comes into the corporate boardroom, and, then, and they say, okay, well, what do we, what do, we do with it? <laughs> right? So they're sitting down and saying, well, you know what? There's all these macro conditions. Europe's got question marks. China was okay, but now all of a sudden there's a lot of question marks. So what I've been hearing on a lot of the earnings conference calls is an increased level of concern. Not, not a change in plans, but like a, an increased level of concern. So... What does that behavioral impact do? Well, it, 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 it kind of holds back the desire to hire. It holds back the desire to invest in plant and equipment. So as they're looking at their capital allocation choices, hire, build more for the future, or put it in the bank where you get nothing, well, let's just return it to shareholders. Okay. So, right, so their buybacks, Two and a half percent coming into this year, down from three and a half last year, looking like maybe it's two or so going forward. And then some, so there's some hiring, there's some investing, but there's more of, a, of an emphasis on the paying back to shareholders, except for those companies that are doing particularly well. 
Okay. And where, where, where they've got a great secular growth opportunity. So in the absence of great growth prospects, they're investing in their investors. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a okay. nice way to say it. All right. Fine. Last question, uh, and this surrounds the uh, preponderance or magnitude of sovereign debt. I think that's how this question feeds in. One of the attendees requests, uh, well, if the Fed raises rates, what's that going to do to the increased debt payments that have to be made by these sovereign uh, debt um, countries? And would that possibly pitch us into a situation where we see a Q4 in the future? Hmm. That is an interesting question. So, you know, rising rates um, will, and just staying domestically for a, a, a a, a second here. Rising rates will mean that the government is going to have to pay more to service the debt. So that's a uh, given. Uh, higher rates uh, also have a benefit of helping the consumer out, uh, believe it or not. So we, we had looked at the balance sheet of consumers and, and consumers are heavily asset sensitive. Uh, they have more cash, uh, they have more assets than they do debt. So even while debt payments may go up because mortgage rates are likely to go higher, I'm sure folks out there, you know, have been around maybe as long as I've been doing this, and you know that you used to get interest rate on your savings accounts, and it's been five years or so since people have gotten uh, interest on their savings accounts and money market funds, CDs, et cetera. So rising rates will help that. And, and, and that'll help the consumer out. So it's kind of a, uh, you win in, in one hand with the consumer, you lose a little bit with the government having spending more, but it's kind of a path to normalization, which is a good thing. Okay, so it'll be pretty much a neutral effect. Yeah, you know, it'll it, there'll be ebbs and flows, concerns back and forth, but net, 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 you want the consumer to be healthier because in this whole, you know, where, is our you know, the right level for debt to, 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 to be? If you think about it in, in in three camps, right? There's there's the consumers, there's corporations, and then there's government. So in the financial crisis, consumers got scared, they delevered. Corporations got scared, they've been delevering too. Their their debt levels are at all, all time low. So government kind of had to step up, otherwise we would, we would have a really great depression kind of thing. So now we're at the point where the government needs the other two. Uh, constituency groups to start taking up the uh, pace and start taking on some more debt, being willing to invest for the future, and they're not quite there yet. So it's at a, it's at a you know important juncture, which gets back to the whole fiscal policy thing. I think. So to sum it up, um, a loss on the government's cost to borrow is a positive to the savers, and that's a good transfer of capital spending to the private sector, right? Right, particularly if the economy is growing. Terrific. All right. So I think we're going to end on that question. I want to give you a couple of uh, reminders. Number one, that we'll do our next conference call. I'm not sure of the topic yet. Sometime between late uh, September and early October. I also want to remind you that our client back to school night is October 1st. You'll be receiving your official invitation in the mail in the next couple of weeks. I want to thank Tom Galvin and City National Rockdale for uh, actually hosting this call with us today. Um, and if you have any particular questions about your own portfolio or your financial plan or need to schedule your review, please do so uh, with your uh, financial advisor or through the front desk. At I Idelis Favoli would be happy to help you out with your scheduling. Once again, thank you for your time today. And the webinar will be available for replay. We'll let you know as soon as that is uh, up on our website. Thank you very much and have a great day.